On my way home from work, I noticed a gas station that shouldn't be there. I had driven home this way a hundred of times and there was never a gas station there before. I nudged my best friend Adam who I had carpooled to work with and he woke up immediately. Huh, what? He said groggily and I slowed down the car pointing my finger. That gas station doesn't belong here, I said pointing. Yeah, I guess not. And prepared to go back to sleep. I nudged him again. Let's go check it out. It says 24 hours on it. I said. He yawned and then nodded his head. Alright, sure, if it'll make you leave me alone so I can get some sleep. I'll go and check it out with you, he said, feeling around his pockets for some tobacco. I'm not sure what you're so excited about it for. It's just a gas station. He always hand rolled his own cigarettes on the spot even putting a little menthol filter into the rolling paper. He lit up the Turkish tobacco, waking up instantly as the sweet smell of it drifted through the car. Well, it's a gas station that wasn't there yesterday, I pointed out. How did it go up so fast? That's not even physically possible. Oh, clearly it is because it's there, he pointed out. I pulled into the parking lot, looking at the sign. Sets 24-hour service. It read simply. The bright fluorescent lights flickered as we pulled up to a pump and got out. Adam grabbing his nearly empty backpack and putting it on without thinking. And then grabbing his keys with a detachable pepper spray canister, his lighter and some tobacco. Something skittered behind the gas station, just out of reach of the lights. A sudden smell of sulfur and rotty meat wafted over to us, making me gag. Oh, bro, Adam said, covering his mouth and nose with his hand. That is just terrible. I nodded, putting my face in the crook of my elbow, trying not to breathe the disgusting fumes. We both walked quickly towards the door, opening it up and going inside. Instantly, the smell was gone. As the door closed behind me, I realized that this was not a normal gas station. Row after row of mannequin heads were lined up in the aisle in front of me, as if they were all for sale. Some of them looked like they had actual human eyes inserted into the plastic. Bits of red still dribbled down them from the eyes. One had its mouth open, a bloody tongue inserted into the silently screaming statue. Whoa, that is awesome, Adam said, pointing to the mannequins as if they were Halloween decorations. I grabbed his arm. I think we need to get out of here, I said, a rising sense of trepidation sending off alarm bells in my head. It's only decorations, man, Adam said laughing. Clearly this is some sort of Halloween store or something. Kind of out of season though. He shrugged. I shook my head and tried backing up towards the door. Turning around, I realized that it had locked behind us. I tried pulling it with all my might, looking for any locks or buttons near it, but there was nothing. It had metal bar after metal bar crisscrossing it vertically and horizontally, as if to keep vandals out, or to keep unwilling hostages in. We're locked in, I said simply, my voice wavering. This isn't right, Adam. We need to get out of here. The panic in my voice seemed to wake him up to our situation, but he still tried to pretend like this was just a normal store. We just need to find somebody that works here, he said calmly. They probably locked it by mistake. We both began looking around and I realized that the store looked much larger on the inside than it did from the outside. There, he said pointing to a glass case on the far side of the store. A man stood there with dark, nearly black eyes, staring at us from inside the bulletproof glass partition. We walked over. I noticed row after row of horrors on our way. One aisle had what looked like medieval devices, all dripping red and covered in it. I even saw what looked like intestines wrapped around some metal spikes 
with the handle to turn the metal that apparently draw the intestines out of somebody. The next row was taxidermied animals. Well, at least at first. There were foxes, cats, dogs, and beavers, all frozen in ferocious positions, their eyes wild and their teeth bared. As I looked farther down, I saw the bodies of people frozen in eternal screams of horror, still wearing their dresses or suits. The heads of men and women were also taxidermied and set side by side on the aisles, all cast with different expressions, some of them smiling, some shrieking, some just staring blankly ahead with dull eyes. I stopped looking down the aisles after that. May I help you? The cleric said through the holes in the plastic as we neared. His dead eyes stared at Adam before flicking over to me. I think we're locked in, I said, my voice weak. The man's eyes had never left mine. I looked down at my hands. The only way out is further in. He pointed to the back of the store. The way you exit is not the way you enter. It is below. What is this, some sort of riddle? Adam asked, fuming. Just let us out of here, man. We don't want to buy any of your weird stuff. Who the heck wants to buy a bunch of mannequin heads or taxidermy beavers and a cat of nine tails? And the clerk just stared at Adam with his black eyes. Look, if you're not going to let us out, I'm going to smash my way out. And the clerk smiled at this but said nothing. Adam shrugged and went to the medieval devices aisle. I found it odd that they sold all these random horrifying objects, but I didn't see any food, snacks, or drinks in the entire place. Perhaps those were all further ahead in some spot that we hadn't discovered yet. Adam grabbed a mace, a thick piece of polished wood with a spiked metal ball on the end. He went over to the door that we came in through and with one final glance back at the cleric. He began smashing the maze as hard as he could into the glass panels of the entryway. He quickly found out that it was made of some sort of shatterproof plexiglass. The first swing reverberated painfully back into his arm, causing him to nearly drop the maze. Then he moved over to the windows and tried smashing those out, with the same result. I checked my phone for service to see if I could call the police, but... All the metal and bulletproof glass apparently affected the signal. I had zero reception inside the station. It looked more and more like we were going to have to play the clerk's little game. We would have to go deeper inside to find a way out, as he had told us. I was quickly regretting ever stepping foot in this bizarre place. Adam massaged his right arm painfully. The shockwaves from hitting the unbreakable glass having clearly caused some minor aches, but he still held the mace in one hand. You better grab a weapon too, Adam said to me, his eyes serious. His normal joking manner totally dissipated. We have no idea what this place is, but I think it's better safe than sorry. I nodded, going to the medieval devices and the weapons aisle, and picking up a scimitar. The curved sword felt somehow comfortable in my hand, the weight of the metal blade perfectly balanced. I gave it a few practice swings and then turned back to him. Well, let's get going, I said. We began walking down an aisle with books wrapped in some white leathery substance that looked suspiciously like human skin. I eyed them with distaste as we passed. I saw the Necronomicon, the Shadows of Solomon, the Malice and Maleficarum, the Wiccan Book of Shadows and many other tomes that I didn't recognize. Some weren't even written in the Latin alphabet, but looked as if they were Tibetan or Sanskrit titles instead. Adam stopped, grabbing a random grimoire that had caught his attention. On the front it simply read, The Angel of Death, in huge silver letters. The book itself was shiny and black like a poisonous snake. A blood-red eye stared out from the bottom of it, and I saw that it dripped blood continuously, as if the book itself was crying. He tucked it into his backpack. 
What are we going to do with that? I asked nervously, and he shrugged. My gut told me to take it. I don't know why. Maybe if we stop, I can look at it closer. As we neared the back of the massive store, which was bigger than any department store that I had ever been in, I began to smell the rotty meat and sulfur once again. I looked around, warily. You've got your game face on, bro. Adam asked me, also smelling the nauseating mixture. I nodded grimly. We both had our medieval weapons out and ready to swing at anything that came near us. But nothing attacked. Instead, we saw a black silhouette in the back, next to a flight of stairs leading downwards. As we got closer, the features of the silhouette became clearer. It stood over ten feet tall, nearly scraping its head on the ceiling. It had a shimmering reptilian skin, with dark red claws on its hands and feet, but its most distinctive feature were its eyes. They glowed like embers, brightening and dimming with every passing second as the creature stared us down. Its hairless face had tiny slits for its nose and ears, and a lipless black mouth that formed a perfectly straight line. Adam went first, looking up at the creature suspiciously. This is the way, friends. It said to us in a guttural, cracking voice, gesturing with a clawed hand to the stairway. I will see you again further in, in the space where the light grows cold and distant. My name is Set, and I greet all the fighters up above, as above, so below. As he spoke, he began to walk backwards and he faded into the wall, until only his glowing ember eyes remained, watching our every move. Adam went first, walking very softly and giving furtive glances to the eyes seemingly embedded into the wall. I walked behind. The stairway smelled musty and ancient, reminded me of the times that I had visited the catacombs in Paris, and it descended for what looked like dozens of stories, tiny cramped steps disappearing into the dark far below. We used our cell phones for light, going slow so as to not slip. It would be a very long and likely lethal fall to the bottom. The lower we went, the colder it became, until I could see my breath in the dim light of the phone. There was no hand roll or anything to grab if I slept. The wall was smooth as sandstone, and as we went lower, many of the stairs were crumbling. My fear of heights made me start to hyperventilate, until Adam turned and calmed me down. Just focus on one step at a time, he said. Don't look beyond that. After what felt like an eternity, we reached a long hallway. We sped up, walking through it. It opened like a huge antechamber, the size of a football stadium. As soon as we stepped foot into it, a stone door slammed shut behind us, keeping us from going back the way that we had come. Both of us jumped at the loud slamming sound turning abruptly. From behind me, a thin hand grabbed my hair, wrenching my head back and putting a cold metal blade to my throat. Adam raised his weapon, but the man behind me simply laughed. His breath smelled like he was rotting from the inside. Combined with the intense odor of sweat, it emanated off of him and it made me want to gag. But I knew that I couldn't move a single millimeter with that sharp knife pressing into my jugular. And put your weapon down, mate, the man said in an Australian accent. Both of you. I dropped my sword on the floor with a loud, echoing clatter, and Adam immediately dropped his mace on the ground, putting his hands up to show that they were empty. Don't kill him, Adam said. We've done nothing to you. The man laughed. Do you know where you are? He said. It doesn't matter what you've done or not done. This is a place of death. No one leaves here alive. The tip of the blade pressed into my skin and... I felt a few drops of blood begin to run down my neck. Both of you move forward. We began to walk into the huge chamber. Torches flickered on the walls. Up ahead, I heard the insane laughter of a woman. 
finger painting, finger painting, just like when I was a kid, she said, also in a deep Australian accent. The insane rambling echoed back to us, and I could barely tell where it was coming from. After what felt like an eternity, I saw an emaciated, sickly looking young woman. She appeared to be of mixed race with tan skinned and long hair. She wore the remnants of rags on her thin body. She reminded me of videos of camp survivors that I had seen. I could count every one of her ribs. Next to her, she had a cooked strip of skin and occasionally stopped and took a bite out of it, smiling and cooing with pleasure at the taste. Long pork, she whispered and then laughed. The smell of rot was overwhelming. It was so thick that I felt like I could taste it. I could see bodies strewn around her. She had cut off their fingers and was using the thick, clotting red to attach them to the walls. I saw dozens of fingers forming random patterns all up and down the wall. Some of them were so old that the skin was falling off, the nails having turned black or purple from the decay. We got some fresh meat, baby girl, the man said with an insane laugh. The woman turned to look at us and I could see in her eyes that she was totally insane as well. She barely focused on anything for more than a second. Her eyes flitted around randomly, as if she was seeing things moving all around us that weren't there. The bodies around her had already been stripped, and it seemed clear that they had been eating pieces from all of them. The waves of nausea and sickness in my stomach only grew worse. But then out of nowhere, what sounded like a tornado siren began to sound. I felt the knife loosen slightly around my throat, and the woman looked up, shrieking in horror. No, not again, she said. Adam noticed the distraction, his eyes meeting mine. He nodded, reaching into his pocket. Down, Adam shrieked, and I grabbed the man's hand, forcing it further away from my throat with all my strength and then I fell to the floor. At the same instant, Adam took out the police mace from his pocket and began spraying it in a concentrated stream into the insane Aussie's face. The lunatic screamed and fell, dropping the knife as I crawled away on the disgusting floor. Within a space of seconds, my clothes and skin were covered. I gagged, trying not to throw up. The woman ran over to the man, trying to pull him up. They're coming, they're coming, she said. But he was in such bad pain that he couldn't even open his eyes, less likely to run from whatever horrors existed at these lower levels. Adam wrenched the knife from the man's hand, kicking him a few times for good measure, and then turned to the woman. She barely weighed a hundred pounds from the look of her, and it wasn't hard to overpower her. Lead us out of here, you nut job, he said to her, and she began screaming. No time, no time. We can't leave my daddy, she wept, the tears forming lines between the dirt and what was caking her face. Adam stuck the knife into her back for good measure and she yelped. Lead us out of here or you'll be dead, he said. She nodded, her crying stopping abruptly, then pointed to a small opening in the wall further down, past the pile of bodies that had surrounded her. Adam let her go and she began to run, both of us closely following. I heard a cacophony of fluttering wings and saw what looked like huge dragonflies descending from further down the chamber. All three of us ran into the opening just as they had passed us by, the swarm focusing on the crying man as he tried to get to his feet and follow us. With a scream like somebody being burned alive, I heard them swarm all over him. A few of the dragonfly-like bees followed us down the tunnel, and I felt a stinging sensation, like burning fire as one of them bit me in the back of the neck. I slapped at it, feeling a stinger hit my hand directly in the center of my left palm. It began to swell, and it took everything that I had in me to not scream. I grabbed the thing, and I pulled it in front of me, and with horror, I realized that it had a tiny human-like face on it. The face had no eyebrows or hair, but it was forced into a perpetual scream. I threw it on the ground and I stomped on it. 
Run, I said, and we sprinted away, the screams of the man following us down the tunnel. It split off at various points, but the insane woman seemed to know where she was going, taking a left and then the next right. Soon, we could see the light of the sun ahead of us. We emerged into a massive courtyard. The walls stood hundreds of feet tall and creatures in cages lined them. Some of them looked like they had been fused together from multiple bodies. Others looked like men and women dressed in suits or hiking clothes, but their faces were totally blank, with no hair, eyes, ears, or mouth. Their heads turned to watch us as we passed, however. The insane woman started crying. Don't want to be here. Don't want to be here, she said. Ah, shut up, Adam said to her. He looked at me. So what now? I pulled out my phone and tried calling the police, but there was no ability to call or text. But an open Wi-Fi network came through reading. Sets, a full service station. I tried to open up websites for the FBI or police agencies to call for help, but they were all blocked. Yet I was able to access this site, and so I started writing up my story. I know that there's only one way out and that's further in. That is, if Set wasn't lying to us. The horrors that await us seem like they will only grow worse. As my friend Adam and I stood in the gargantuan courtyard, surrounded by hundreds of monstrous beings in cages, we wondered what we should do next. We looked at the insane woman. Her dark hair hung in matted, bloody strings around her face, and her eyes were hollow and blank. She looked past us with a thousand yard stare. Adam walked up to her, standing only a foot away from him so she couldn't look past him. What's your name? He asked softly. She muttered to herself, but I couldn't hear what she was saying. He pointed at me. This is my friend Jerry, and my name is Adam. She suddenly sprang to attention, her lifeless doll eyes meeting his gaze. A fleeting moment of lucidity and sanity seemed to return to her. My name is Mary, and you killed my father. Adam shook his head. Technically, those mutant bugs killed your father, he responded. And that was only after you guys tried to take us and eat us. At least I assume that was what your final goal was. He said this in such a deadpan, emotionless way that I had to resist the urge to laugh. But I think we need to focus on the present issue. Where are we? He pointed around at the creatures in the cages. Many of them looked at us, at least with those eyes. Some looked human, but had no hair, eyes, or mouth, a nose or ears on their heads. They seemed to breathe through their skin. A slight expansion and contraction rippling through their body every few moments. Unexpectedly, with a loud clattering that echoed off the walls of the courtyard, three teenagers came running through a small tunnel on the other end of the room. I hadn't noticed the tunnel entrance, as it was hidden from my view by closely spaced cages. One of the kids had deep claw marks down his chest. His t-shirt was in tatters and blood ran in rivulets down the white cloth, turning it into a deep red. The two girls behind him were breathing hard, their eyes wide, looking behind them every few seconds. And then they saw us before noticing all the creatures in cages all around the courtyard, and they went as still as statues. The insane woman, Mary, took advantage of the moment of distraction and ran away, back in the direction that we had come. Dang, Adam said, about to sprint after her. I put my hand on his shoulder. Let her go, I said. Realistically, what are we going to do? We either have to keep her around, which means having to constantly watch a lunatic who would kill us in a second, or we would have to tie her up or even do the same to her. None of those are good choices, and I don't even want the blood of a lunatic on my hands if I can help it. It's probably just better to let her go. And of course, I had a feeling that we would be seeing her again 
though I didn't say this out loud. The teenage boy with the shirt walked forward, putting his hands out to show that he was unarmed. Adam kept the knife in his right hand and covertly shoved his keys with the police mace towards me with his other hand. I took them, turning the nozzle to the firing position, so at least we would have one ranged weapon to gain an advantage if this group turned out to be as insane as Mary and her father. But as they inched closer, I realized they were just scared kids. I stepped forward, putting the keys in my pocket and showing them my hands. We're not going to hurt you, I said loudly, my voice echoing through the courtyard. The monster nearest to me, a man in a surgeon's uniform with pure white cataract-covered eyes, stared towards me, agitated by my yelling. Where do you come from? We found this place in Florida, the boy said, walking forward and wincing as he wiped his hand across the deep cuts on his chest. And we found it in Massachusetts, Adam said. Was it a random-looking gas station that appeared out of nowhere? The boy looked uncertain. Well, we had never been in that part of Florida before, he said. It was a road trip across the states. We were going to Universal and Disney World and got a little bit lost. We were low on gas and found a 24-hour station in the middle of a swamp on some dirt road with no houses around for miles. I thought that it was weird, but beggars can't be choosers, right? We went inside to pay and the doors locked behind us. I nodded. Yeah, mostly the same story for us, I said. Except I know for a fact that this gas station showed up in less than a day. For all I know, it may have just appeared in seconds. And I'm willing to bet if we talked to more people here, they would have similar stories. Except they all probably came from different locations. The last group that we ran into sounded like they had Australian accents. And I would be willing to bet that if we went further in, we would find people from all over. This thing must be showing up randomly across the world and letting people in. It's like a lobster trap. Once you get in, you can't get out. But you have to keep going deeper and deeper inside to look for a way out. Until what? Adam said. The lobster fisherman catches us and lets us out. I laughed. The fishermen only let the lobsters out when they're ready to boil them alive. I said and he frowned at this. Do you guys have any weapons? One of the girls interrupted. She was a short and skinny redhead. Adam pointed back the way that we had come. There are a couple weapons back in the chamber there, but I wouldn't head that way, he said. There were bugs who eat people alive. But somehow there was a warning first, almost like a trap had been set off. It sounded like a tornado siren or something. She nodded. Yeah, it was the same with us. We took the stairs down and ended up finding a small tunnel immediately off to the left under the torches. As soon as Jason had stepped past the first stone though, the wailing sound had started, and something came out of the walls. The boy named Jason continued her story. It was all hunched over and it looked like there was a secret trap door built into the wall, and then a smell like sulfur and roadkill came out like a wave of stench, and it took these huge claws and swiped my chest. He lifted his shirt and I gasped. The blood hadn't started to clot but still kept running down in streams. He must have lost quite a bit by this point, but the adrenaline seemed to keep him going. Black and purple lines went out from the cuts in all directions, reminding me of a wound that had gone septic. As I watched, I could see it worsen moment by moment. Pieces of his skin began to fall off, bones morphing and ripping through his clothes. God, it hurts. Please, something is wrong, Jason said, reaching out towards me. Droplets began to fall from his right eye and then his left one, and he started screaming as his body began to transform into something else. The third girl in the group, a tall brunette teenager, began to point behind Jason and scream. I saw a glimpse of a shorter, red-headed teenage girl, identical to the one in the group, except this one was missing multiple fingers 
and her clothes were all torn as well. Blood poured out of her hand where the stumps of the fingers reflexively tightened and loosened on nothing. She looked like she had been stung over and over, her face swollen. The doppelganger looked at the whole one in shock as Jason fell to the floor. His scream stopped with the pieces of bone had started to grow out of his back. He writhed and seized, his eyes rolling into the back of his head and coming back to focus on me a couple more times. Who are you? The injured redhead said to the uninjured one, who showed an ear-to-ear -ear grin and began to float above the ground. Her eyes had turned red like flaming embers, and her skin began to rapidly darken into a black sheen. Her body grew, the legs and arms lengthening as all the clothes began to be reabsorbed inside the body of the monster. The injured girl screamed as a floating set reached out his arm towards her, softly rubbing the side of her swollen cheek before quickly grabbing her by the jaw and snapping her. The sound of the bone fracturing and the look of horror and torment in that girl's eyes were haunting. The brunette girl had used the distraction to run over next to Adam and me. Sat turned his gaze back towards us, ignoring Jason who was still having a seizure on the ground, spitting out foam. You both intrigued me, he said to Adam and me in a guttural tone. It seemed to come from the walls around us as well as his reptilian mouth. But especially you, he said pointing to me. I will make a deal with you, Jerry. You give me your soul and I will tell you the way to the exit at the center of the labyrinth. I shook my head at this. How about you go screw yourself? I said, spiteful. The sad only laughed. Behind him, Jason had stopped seizing and now looked to be either unconscious or gone. Well, in that case, said said, out of a spirit of fairness... I will give you three survivors a five-minute head start before. He pointed to the cages around us at the sides of the courtyard, smiling. The brunette girl gasped, her mouth a small O of fear. You wouldn't, she said, starting to cry. Set laughed at this and put his hands up towards the sky. Adam grabbed one of her hands and they followed my lead as I sprinted towards the tunnel that Mary had taken earlier. I hoped that maybe we could find her again and force her to show us the way towards the center of this maze of horrors, where said it claimed freedom lay. As we ran into the dark, cramped tunnels, glowing symbols that hadn't been there before began to illuminate the path in front of us. We came out to the massive chamber where we found Mary weeping over the body of her father. Her clothes were in tatters and her back scarred with countless tiny symbols that had been engraved into her skin. They reminded me of Tibetan scripts that I had seen, or the constructed elvish language in Lord of the Rings. The body of her father was swollen to twice its normal size, small dribbles of a clotted red coming out of his face, ears, nose, and mouth. I saw hundreds of the human-faced insects around his body. Many of them crushed or their wings ripped off. It looked as if he had gone down fighting. I wondered where the mutated bugs had gone, but time was running short and I knew that that would be a mystery better left for another time. Adam grabbed Mary by the shoulder and rapidly explained the situation. Her eyes had dried up and even though she seemed to look past us at invisible shadow people or whatever other hallucination or insane mind made up, she understood enough of it. And then Seth's voice echoed all around us, coming from nowhere and everywhere. Time is up, friends, he said, a tone of glee and amusement in his voice. Open the cages, release the wanderers. From very far off, I heard metal doors slamming open, and I knew that we had to act. Mary, show us the way to the safest room you know, I said. We need time to think and, except at that moment, time had run out. We had encountered on the demonic form of Jason, 
tearing out of the darkness at a superhuman speed and jumping on the brunette girl. He began to slash and rip at her with huge black talons. His body was hunched, spikes sticking out of his spine. His lips were missing, showing huge, bloody teeth instead, and his eyes and skin had turned a pure, sickly white. The deep claw marks on his chest totally healed now. Adam tried stabbing at the monster with his small dagger, but then I remembered that we had weapons only a few feet away, where we had first been abducted. I ran towards the door, grabbing my scimitar. As the monster was focused on ripping the brunette girl to pieces, I came up from behind it and swung as hard as I could. Time seemed to slow down as the sword had connected with its neck, and the inertia took it deeper and deeper. The monster uttering a final shriek that was cut off at the same time as its throat was severed. The head fell to the floor, the white eyes still looking up at me with hatred, the lipless mouth still opening and closing, like a fish suffocating on land. The lump body of the monster fell backwards, showing the damage to the girl beneath. She was not yet dead. I knew that it was only a matter of moments, though. Her throat had been slashed and pieces of skin on her chest were missing, and I could see spurts of bright red exiting out of a dozen deep gashes every time that her heart beat. She tried to speak, but she only choked on her own words. She died with her eyes open, staring in fear and horror. We have to go, Adam said, pulling on my arm. I saw that he had gone and grabbed his maze from in front of the locked door 20 feet away, and I realized that he was right. I could hear footsteps approaching down the same tunnel that we had taken. Mary was clearly agitated even more than usual, and was gibbering and saying something unrecognizable. Adam prodded her in the back, whispered something to her, and she nodded and began running. We both followed her closely behind. She took us to a completely different tunnel. This one went further down in a spiraling ramp. We ran for at least 10 minutes and the ramp never leveled off. Torches lined the walls on both sides, giving us light. I wondered at just how many stories beneath the ground we were now. It had to have been hundreds. Finally, after what felt like over a mile of descending, we came to a cave system that seemed to glow within its own inner blue light. Stalagmites and stalactites made sharp spikes on both sides of us. Mary pointed to a small door to the right that had been hewn from the rock itself. It had a symbol on it that I had never seen before, resembling a spiral with an arrow pointing up. That means food, Mary said in a hushed voice. There are a few of these rooms, though many of them have traps in them. She pushed through, and showed us a room filled with cans and bottles. Most of them were empty and thrown to the side, but I saw dozens more were still unopened along the metal shelving of the back wall. Adam and I quickly shut the door and looked at the food supplies. I realized that I was starving. All of the running and adrenaline had exhausted me and just the thought of food made my mouth begin to water. We quickly opened up some cans of tuna fish and found some bottles of soda in the corner. While all three of us ate and drank as quickly as we could, we tried to formulate a plan. Do you know where the center of the labyrinth is, Mary? Adam asked her. She had seemed to take more of a liking to him than to me. It wasn't uncommon as Adam was a very talkative, selfless, and gregarious person, while I was more of an introvert and a loner. To my surprise, Mary nodded yes to the question. A slim ray of hope entered my mind for the first time in what felt like forever. Adam's eyes sparkled too, as he was excited by the prospect of getting closer to escape. We are heading there now. She said while scooping out little bites of plain tuna fish with her disgusting fingers and forcing them into her mouth. There are less traps at the center, but no food or drink. That's why Daddy and I always stayed closer to the edge, where we could get long pork. She smiled at this. 
You mean people, I said, and Adam shot me a glance telling me to shut up. But Mary only smiled wider. Oh well, yes, otherwise I would have starved months ago. We have to stretch our food supplies here, but I grew to like the taste of long pork, especially when it was dried and cooked. It reminded me of jerky, she said, licking her lips. Mary, how long have you been down here? Adam asked. Mary only shook her head. Uh, must to have been years, she said frowning. Looking at her sickly emaciated frame, the rags that she wore that had once been clothing, the way that her shoes were falling apart, I thought she was probably right. And then we began to hear footsteps outside of the door. We all stopped speaking instantly. Adam and I grabbed our weapons and started standing, ready to fight. I motioned to Mary and Adam nodded, giving her the dagger back that we had stolen from her father. I wondered whether it was a smart move, seeing as she was clearly insane and might just stab us in the back to try to eat us, but I had a feeling that we didn't have much of a choice. An old quote ran through my mind. Misery acquaints a man with strange bedfellows. And I almost felt an urge to chuckle, thinking just how true that really was. Something slammed against the door, sending it flying open. Adam and I waited a moment, Mary behind us. We were out of view of the door, but standing next to the threshold so that, if somebody walked through, we could attack from the side as soon as they stepped a foot into the room. It was what ended up happening. As the surgeon in the mask had entered, a scalpel raised. I tried to bring my weapon down on his head, but he was amazingly fast, ducking at the final moment. The sword whistled harmlessly overhead. He stuck his scalpel into my leg, making me yell out in pain. But Adam took the moment of distraction to bring his mace smashing down on the surgeon. The surgeon's head erupted and bits and pieces of it flew into my mouth as well. I started wiping furiously at the coppery taste and my lips and I started spitting. The burning pain from my leg rose up and looking down, I saw rivulets of red soaking into my blue jeans. I hoped that it hadn't hit an artery. We need to go now. Mary hissed at us and we both nodded. I was significantly slowed down now, hobbling along beside them, but the pain wasn't as bad as I had expected. I figured it had been an extremely lucky shot to avoid crippling me or causing me to bleed out down here. Adam ripped off a piece of his t-shirt and made an impromptu bandage, tightening it with knots. We heard more footsteps behind us, and all three of us found huge stalagmites to hide behind, peeking out in the subtle glow of the cave. We saw a few of the faceless humanoids pass us by, one wearing an expensive black suit and the other two wearing hiking clothing and windbreakers. Their faceless heads seemed to ripple, expanding and contracting. As I wondered if it was a result of them breathing through their skin, I wondered at just what they were in fact. Mary nodded at us to keep going forward and we did. I could hear shrieks ahead of us. Looking around a bend in the cave, I saw two middle-aged men trying to fight off the faceless monsters. One of them had a pistol. He raised it to the chest of one of them, blowing its heart out. The monster fell back, but another one grabbed him from behind, and the other living monster quickly knocked out the second man. And then the two monsters worked in tandem, one reaching out to the conscious man's chest, his fingers gently touching the fabric of the shirt, and then with unimaginable strength, he began to pull the man's skin and bones apart. The man shrieked, but the other monster had his arms pinned behind his back too tightly for him to fight back. Soon, they had his heart out of his chest and the man's head had slumped to the side. One of the monsters put it up to its blank head. The head appeared to split open in the middle, thousands of tiny black lamprey teeth showing for a moment as he ate the man's heart. They let the man's body fall to the side and... The other monster repeated the process with the unconscious man, eating his heart as well. And then they continued forward, 
with the only remaining sign of their passing being three bodies with massive holes in the chest. Mary, Adam, and I began to move forward again. Countless footsteps were now approaching from behind and we all began to run as fast as we could. Soon the cave system ended and we came out in an ancient oak forest. The two monsters were waiting for us there and Adam and I walked forward attacking. I quickly dispatched to mine but the one attacking Adam was too quick. The monster had gotten behind Adam and was about to grab him by the neck when Mary had jumped in, stacking her dagger into the spot where the abomination's face should have been. It gave an ear-splitting shriek as its head opened up and it fell back. But the distraction had allowed dozens more monsters from the cages to reach the end of the cave. We all ran for our lives. This way, Mary said, panting, she took us down a small deer trail and we found an ancient stone cellar with a heavy door attached. We all got in and found that it had a latch to lock it from the inside. Adam stuck his mace through the latch just as a monster had approached from the outside, beginning to smash at it. I heard dozens of more footsteps from all around us, and I knew that we were surrounded. Well, this is it, I said sitting down and sighing. There's no getting out of this one. We can't fight off all of them out there. Mary sat down too, humming to herself, but I noticed that tears were now flowing down her face. Adam only grinned at me, taking his backpack off. Did you forget? Adam asked. I grabbed that book when we first got in here. I told you guys my instincts were screaming at me to take it. He pulled the large, ancient tome out with the title the angel of death written on the front. Drops of blood constantly dropped out the front of it. The voice of Set began to vibrate and reverberate around us. Will you give your souls yet, friends? He asked. There's no need for all of you to die like sheep led to the slaughter, for I am the good shepherd, and I hate to see my sheep ripped apart by the wolves. He laughed at this. Adam ignored the voice coming from nowhere and everywhere and opened the door. The pages were blank at first, but then text written in blood began to appear. The book was upside down from my point of view, but Adam quickly read it, frowning. Mary, let me see the knife, Adam said, putting out his hand. Mary handed it over. According to the book, all I need to do is say a prayer and carve this name in my arm and this thing will come to us and save us all. The door to the stone cellar began to shake more violently, as more bodies seemed to show up by the minute. You better hurry up then, I said to him. We don't have much time until those things break through. Fools, the voice of Set screamed. You should not open that book. Do you wish to bring the Watcher to your world? The Watcher will kill the sun, destroy the moon, blot out every star. The Watcher does not care at all for your lives. He continued to ramble, but we all ignored it, and Adam began the ritual. The poem appeared in red on the pages, and he began to read it, holding the knife over his left arm. An old man dies, a newborn breeze, the bugs feast, the infection sees. Winter enters and never leaves. The lone dissenter lives and deceives. The angel of death arises again. The eternal cycle of a bloody rain. As he read the last stanza, he also cut the name Israel into his left arm, wincing for a moment as the sharp knife did its work. And then he held his arm above his head the blood trickling down, forming and reforming into large and larger rivulets, and then turned sharply and aimed directly at his heart. As soon as the first drop had reached the center of his chest, appearing to defy gravity as it rolled down and back up his chest, an amazing and horrible thing started to happen. Adam's eyes began to emanate a soft, glowing white light, and he began to float above the ground. Behind him, I saw dozens of visions of his floating body splitting off, as if I was looking into a mirror image reflected into another mirror image, 
The dozens kept going until it looked like hundreds, and then millions and then eternity, disappearing into a point at the horizon. Each of the bodies began to fade in and out and then eyes started to come into view, swarming and morphing all over these countless bodies. Soon I couldn't see anything that once had been Adam. His entire body was covered in soft, glowing white eyes that stared out in all directions at once. And then the billions of eyes on the eternal bodies all turned to me at once. And I felt an impending sense of terror and doom of an intensity that I had never imagined possible. Who calls on me? A soft voice said from everywhere and nowhere at once. It slightly shook the walls and floor. I tried to look away but I couldn't. The eternal copies of Adam's body all collapsed into one in a single moment and I was back to just staring at the spot where Adam's body had been. The endless hallway of mirror images disappearing instantly. Mary stood up, backing away to the very edge of the cellar. I knew that I had to answer even though all those staring eyes seemed to bring me to the brink of madness. We need your help, Azrael, I said. The angel laughed as the door began to splinter. I could see claws and hands reaching through feeling around for what held it shut. One of them began to sneak close to the mace and shake it loose. And why would I help you? He asked, the voice seeming to shake the ground with every syllable. Because, I said, pointing, Set has released those things to kill your host. And without a host, I have a feeling that you'll be going back to whatever otherworldly prison you came from. The eyes of the angel all turned towards the door as the mace fell out and the door swung open. Dozens of monsters began to pour in. The floating angel laughed at this, raising his arms. Huge thorns and spikes began to shoot out of the leaves and dirt, wrapping around each of the monsters and dragging them into the ground. Within seconds, their screams had all ceased. No one stood there. From behind me, I heard another deeper voice. Set's fiery eyes were embedded into the stone wall that he stepped out, his black poisonous body appearing at once. He and the angel of death stared at each other for a long moment. Mary grabbed my arm and we began to back out of the stone cellar. As we got to the threshold, Set raised one arm and the ceiling began to collapse on Ezreal. Massive blocks of stone fell on his head, and within seconds he was buried. The cacophony of the collapsing structure made my ears ring, and Mary and I began to sprint blindly ahead. As I looked back, I saw the stones go flying up in the air, Ezreal floating up from the place where the stone cellar had stood. Set was also flying, glancing down at his enemy with hatred. Ezreal raised an ethereal hand and a huge oak tree was ripped out of the ground and went flying in Set's direction. He easily blocked it, flying higher into the forest and letting it pass harmlessly underneath them. Up ahead, I saw a hatchway in the middle of the forest. It didn't look like it belonged, but I knew that we had to find somewhere to hide. As Set and Azrael fought, I ran up to it opening up and what I saw astonished me. I was looking down into the hatchway, but on the other side, I was looking up through the spot next to where Adam and I had parked my car. I looked back and saw Ezreal and Set throwing fire and lava at each other, setting the forest to light around them. I nodded at Mary and she jumped through without hesitation, and then I followed. It was a disorienting experience going down through the hatchway only to find myself crawling up out of a secret dirt door a few feet in front of my car. As soon as I was out, the door slammed shut behind me and it turned back into flat dirt. I looked around and saw that there was no longer a gas station there, just endless trees. I brought Mary to the hospital and then I went home, wrapping up my own wounds with a first aid kit. I didn't know what to do about Adam. After washing and sleeping, I decided to go to the police station the next day and report Adam missing. I told them that I had brought him home from work, but that I hadn't been able to get in contact with him since then. 
And they ignored my report, saying that if he still hadn't shown up in a couple more days, then I should come back. I have a feeling that I will likely never see him again. His sacrifice allowed Mary and me to escape that horrid place, however. I hope that he's still alive somewhere, and that maybe he will find a way out, just like we did. But whenever I sleep now, I hear Adam screaming. In my dreams, he always has pure white irises and pupils, and he always looks around with terror, asking where he is. Behind him, I see an eternal sky covered in ethereal, glowing eyes. <laughs>